items of consideration, but nevertheless important. This makes the unit uniform, and that's what counts. I've already briefly mentioned that we choose to wear our badges of rank in the lower point of the shirt collar. However, if the decision is uh, made to wear cloth stripes on an armband, then that is certainly quite acceptable. The pipe and drum majors traditionally wear four chevrons with points uppermost. Sergeants wear three chevrons with points downward. Now the types of jackets we are displaying are of the day wear type, the Argyle, and the Prince Charlie. First, the day wear, as the name would suggest, this is normally worn during the so-called daylight hours. One would wa normally wear brogues or gillies, plain hose, waist belt, shirt with four in hand tie. And the jacket is unbuttoned, worn with or without headdress. No, when headdress is worn, it's more likely to be the Balmoral. However, the Glengarry is quite acceptable although, in my view, it tends to be a little bit more formal. Perhaps if you think of earth tones or the Tweedy look, this would give you a sense of day wear. Now, the Argyle, this is considered a hybrid. It's a crossbreed between the day wear and the evening wear. But don't knock it. It has a useful place in the scheme of things. It may be used as a day wear with the appropriate color matches in shirt, tie, hose, garter flashes, etc. This could then be converted into an evening ensemble by changing to an off-white evening hose, black handled skin do, a pleated evening shirt with a black bow tie. The Prince Charlie. Ah yes, the Bonnie Prince. This is probably the modern all-time favorite, the classic evening attire. However, there does seem to be a general tendency for overkill, which spoils the look. Don't try to wear all the bells and whistles at one time. Here are a few do's and don'ts. Do wear a typical after six evening shirt with fine pleats, rather than the exaggerated ruffle type. Do wear an evening sparren, and not that type for day wear. Do wear a black handled skin do, rather than the horn handled type. Also, please wear a bow tie and not four in hand, and fine knit hose, either off-white or colored, matching the kilt, but please refrain from the wearing the heavy duty knit. Wear a well-polished pair of brogues or gillies, but please, no core frames. The Montrose. This style of evening dress is probably the oldest. And as with the Prince Charlie, the same comments with respect to foot and leg wear should apply. Color coordination is very important with this attire. The belted plaid and waist belt is worn and finishes off this very elegant ensemble. Military style tunics. Tunics obviously come in many different styles. Far too many for me to comment on separately. But one thing should be common to all, and that is that they should fit well. And when worn, they should be buttoned at all times and collars fastened. It's considered very bad form to be seen with collars and buttons or zippers loosened. I realize that it can become quite warm on occasions, but please tough it out. Wait until you find an opportunity to take the tunic off entirely and then change into something more relaxing. Belts and sashes. Whether it's civilian or military dress, the waist belt should fit quite tightly. Do not allow it to droop. We have a tendency to hang things on the waist belt, such as dirks and bayonets, the cartouche, that's a small carrying pouch. And having done all this, it obviously puts additional weight on that particular part of the belt. 
which creates that droop. Keep the belt tight, eliminate the John Wayne effect. Dirks and bayonets. The Piper's Dirk has the accompanying knife and fork and is usually worn on the front right hip suspended from the waist belt. If a bayonet is worn, it is suspended from the waist belt by a leather or web pouch, which is also known as a frog, and is worn on the left rear hip. Piper's waist belts and cross belts are traditionally black. Drummers traditionally wear white waist belts and slings. Sashes. Should the unit go military, then sergeants and warrant ranks should wear the red sash. Drum majors and sergeants wear the sash from the right shoulder under the epaulet with the tassels resting on the left rear hip. The pipe major wears his the opposite way. In all cases, the sash is worn over the waist belt. Sporans. Although they come in a variety of sizes, colors, and designs, we'll try to categorize them in three groups. One, a band type or horsehair, non-functional, strictly ornamental type. Two, a day wear, mostly leather, small amount of fur, leather tassels with a flap and snapper closing at the front. Three, evening wear, more elaborate, silver, high quality fur, silver chains and fur tassels. As I promised, I will introduce the hybrid. The manufacturers have come up with the crossbreed again, and I think it has to do with cost, possibly. Supposedly, it serves both day wear and evening wear requirements, but in my view, it fails miserably at both. As you see, the construction is more like a day wear style, but is dressed up with a white pony hide. Just a note about the height of the sparring, it should rest at about the crotch level, with the hairs of the band sparring at about the same level as the bottom of the kilt. Headdress. Our unit displays these types of headdresses at various times during the year. One, Kitchener helmet, worn during the summer months by the color guard. Two, the Glengarry, worn by all pipers and drummers during the summer and winter and by the color guard during the winter months. The traditional and beautiful feather bonnet will be worn when in full winter rig. Regardless of which type of headdress is worn, it should be worn squared away, approximately one half inch above the eyebrows, and the cap should fit in such a way that the headband does not pull down below the crown of the head. Should it do so, it gives a slovenly appearance and smacks of a slipshod and careless manner and attitude. The Piper's Plaid. Donning the plaid requires assistance. Therefore, these directions are rather more for the dresser than the dressee. The Piper should be fully dressed, including the cross belt and waist belt prior to donning the plaid. One, unbutton the left shoulder epaulet and allow it to flap down over the upper arm. Two, place the plate over the le piper's left shoulder with the short end hanging down the front. Have the piper hold the short end with his left hand. Three, wrap the other end or the long end around the piper's back, over the cross belt, under the armpit, and under the cross belt in front, and back over to the left shoulder on top of the short end of the plaid. Four, adjust the plaid for proper fit and length by either taking up 
or letting down the material which has been wrapped around the body. Now re-button the epaulet over the plate. Note that the plate should fit snugly around the body without gaps and sags or droops. The fringe on the long end of the plate hanging down the left side should extend to approximately two inches below the top of the spat. Since the plate, when completed, should be approximately at the top of the spat level. Five.